ಸಾಧುತೇ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿ ರಾಧಾಕಾಂತಮಸ್ತೆ ತಾಪ್ತಕಾಂಚನ ಗೋರಂಗೆ ರಾಧೆ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವೃಷಭಾನುಸುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಂಚಕೌಪಾತರುಭ್ಯಸ್ಯಾಪಾಸಿಂಧುಭೈವ ಪತಿ ಪವಾನಿಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವಿಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪ್ರೇಷ್ಟಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಘೋರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷಿ ಪಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯಣೆ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ್ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸತಿ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ ಹರೆ so we are continuing uh, our talk about uh shri prabhupad and past times which took place earlier in our krishna consciousness movement of course this is the holy name week and we want to understand more how shri prabhupad went about distributing that holy name around the world yesterday we had uh, the purnima uh, and um, and we try to encourage people to get books like shrimad bhagavatam bhagavatam that was the day before right tuesday so anyway today well yes yesterday was the was the, the day you no know, prabhupad went on ma vasan ma uh but he went to america or took sanyas on vishwarup mahotsava which was on the purnima that was on tuesday and today we're remembering the glories of the sankirtan movement shri prabhupad wanted to establish world sankirtan i was telling how the devotees came three householder couples came to england and introduced krishna consciousness in london and then shri prabhupad told them now you come with me to india we're going to begin the world sankirtan movement and he called different devotees who were big leaders of our krishna consciousness movement in the different temples in the usa who were all very uh mature, somewhat mature devotees you know <laughs> i try to understand they've been devotees for 2 years or 3 years they were considered mature very senior devotees because it was the very beginning of our movement but they were full time devotees they were completely engaged in krishna consciousness and they were going out every day on sankirtan and they somehow they were managing temples there in the western countries and how did they get the money to maintain a temple that not that that was not an easy thing 
Nowadays, of course, you, the temple, you have so many Hindu people, so many Indian people come and they have the culture to contribute to, the, to support the temple. But in the 1960s and 70s, there were very less Indian living there in the USA. The temples were all Westerners. Our Sunday program in New York, I was in the Brooklyn Temple in New York in 74, 75, and it was all Westerners. You know, very, very rare an Indian person came. There were very few there in, in New York in those days. It's only in the recent times that more people have come there. But somehow the devotees were supporting the temple. And of course at one point in New York they even bought a skyscraper building. They purchased a big building in Manhattan, in downtown Manhattan. They purchased this big building which was near to the, the theater area, near to Broadway. And they established the temple there and Prabhupada also came there and he, he liked it. Of course, eventually the devotees decided to sell it, which was maybe not the right thing to do. They sold it and they re relocated to another area. And now, of course, they have a they have a, they, they do have a good property in New York. They have a property in Brooklyn, which is valued at something like sixty sixty million dollars. You know, they purchased it at a much lower price. They purchased it many years ago in the 1980s. But in today, they were, you know, just a couple of years ago, they, they were offered $60 million. And there was some talk, should we take the money or not? But they decided, no, we should keep the building. The property is more important than the money. And so the devotees still have that building, and that's in Brooklyn, the temple. Anyway, in Prabhupada's time, we had a big building in Manhattan, <laughs> which was good, you know, Manhattan, the center of New York City. And it was a big building, and so there were many devotees. And Prabhupada liked it. He would come there, the devotees would have, there was a theater inside the building, there was an auditorium and the devotees would do theater, drama there. Prabhupada would watch the drama. And so how did we get such a big building in New York? We were, we were just collecting money in the streets. We were always on the streets distributing books. And we, we also would distribute things like incense. Uh, I, I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement in London in 1971. And before I had joined the movement, I had been purchasing the incense which the devotees make. Because the devotees, be, this was one of the ways in which they were able to support the temple through some incense business and the devotees learned how to make the incense themselves. You know in India traditionally they, they roll the incense by hand. The village ladies will sit and they will roll incense by hand. But uh, in the USA the devotees they developed the, the, another way to make incense. They would purchase this oil and they would purchase what, something which was called a punk, which was just simply, you know, it, it's an incense stick without any oil on it, without any incense put into it. And they would purchase these punks, you could buy big crates of them. They were made somewhere like in Hong Kong or somewhere, in, and, and the devotees would buy these crates of incense sticks. And then they would just dip them into oil. They dip them into the oil and then put them to dry and then put them in packets. And the packet was very nicely designed. It was a very beautiful packet and 
Of course the Maha Mantra was on the packet and the invitation was there also that come to visit the temple, you know, you have more sunrise meditation and like that and Sunday love feast and so you know I was purchasing the incense, it was, it was different incense from what the usual Indian incense, usual Indian incense is jasmine and sandalwood but this, the incense which the devotees make was strawberry, cherry, <laughs> orange, lemon, you know, heavy and patchouli, something you know very strong, powerful and so you know, we Westerners, we were more inclined to that kind of incense, very, very fragrant, very firm. And we were distributing that incense and uh, when I became a devotee, the first service they gave me was to run the incense business because the devotees who had come from America to begin the business, they wanted to go back to America. They had be, they'd been in England long enough and they wanted to go back to America. And so they, I had become a devotee, they told me, you take over the business and you run the incense business. So that was like my first service in Krishna consciousness, taking, doing the incense business. And we would purchase the oil and purchase it and just dip it and then put it to dry. <laughs> it, the, the whole area, the whole street where we lived would smell of the incense, you know. <laughs> Not all the neighbors liked the smell of the incense. Anyway, we were making incense and the devotees would help. The devotees would pack it and I would be the one to go out to the shops, to sell it to the shops, to get the orders. And we would also distribute it sometimes on the street. And it happened one time, uh, one time there was a very big rock concert in London. You know it was the 1970s and there were lots of heavy music groups, you know, big name groups. Like that the Beatles had been there and they'd broken up just recent, just at that time. And there were other groups and it was very big. And there was, so they organized this big rock concert and the people who were organizing the concert, they came to our temple and they asked us, they said, we want you to give everyone who comes to the concert, we want you to give them a free stick of incense and we will pay you for it. And so we said, okay, great, you know, we're going to be there in incense. And we will have our books there and we were doing book distribution. So th this was a very typical thing which we were doing, you know, Hare Krishna devotees. We were always at these kind of festivals and we were distributing prasadam. People would come and have prasadam and they'd sit and talk with us and in get introduced to Krishna consciousness. Like this, we were making, but somehow we were getting funds to maintain the temple. But it, it was not easy, we were, we were always in debt. And there was this one devotee from America, his name was Nara Narayan. So this Nara Narayan, he was like the Vishwakarma of Iskon. He was very good in carpentry and stuff, you know, making things. So. Uh, he had been brought to London to build a Rathi Atra chariot car for Rathi Atra. We were going to do Rathi Atra. The only problem was there was no money. <laughs> Where to get money, you know? It's not easy to put on a Rathi Atra festival. You need to have funds, you have. So we're, and so I was the only one which had any money in the temple, I, mean, I had the business, I was running the incense business. So this Nara Narayan Prabhu, he would always come to me and say, oh, where's the money, I've got to get money. <laughs> and I would try to give him some, I'd get something, but I'm very miserly, I'm very stingy, you know. <laughs> so I would only give a little amount and say, oh, no, i got to have more than that. You know? And Nara Narayan was very, he was a very passionate guy, you know, he'd get really angry and 
sometimes he beat up the temple president, you know, <laughs> you've got to give me money, I'm trying to build this chariot for Prabhupada, you should give me money. And he'd start beating the temple president and then the other big guy from America would come and he would beat up Nara Narayan and say, well, so like this, you know. <laughs> it, this was the early days of ISKCON, you know. We were all young and very passionate and we had a lot of enthusiasm and energy. Anyway, somehow we built the chariot and Prabhupada came and Prabhupada took part in the Rathiyatra and everything. So, Prabhupada would always like to come to London because he knew his Guru Maharaj, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada had wanted Krishna consciousness established in the Western world. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had sent his disciples to London and they hadn't done very much. They, they had, you know, some old lady or something and they had registered the place, but there were no real activities going on there. So to all, in, you know, nobody knew anything about the Gaudiya Mat at that time, you know. They, although they had gone there and they had met people, they hadn't really done anything substantial to establish Krishna consciousness. So that was in the 1920s they had gone there to London. So now Prabhupada, in the 1960s they managed to go, Prabhupada's devotees, they went there and they did something. And they established the temple and Prabhupada, of course, the whole story about the deities, Radha Landaneshwara, how they got the deities, that was another wonderful thing. Krishna arranged that Radharani had a broken finger, her little finger was broken. And because the little finger was broken on the deity Radharani, the people who were going to install the deities decided, oh no, we cannot install this deity because it's, she's got a broken finger. And so Prabhupada came and Prabhupada said, we will take the deities. And, and they took them, they picked them up immediately and walked off with them. And Prabhupada told the devotees, he said, Radharani arranged like this just so that she could come and be in our temple. So the deities are there, they're installed, they're still worshipped there today and Prabhupada named them as Radha Landan Ishwara. And so Srila Prabhupada was very attached to those deities. He liked very much to come and see the deities. He would always be concerned about the standard of deity worship. He would always be concerned to see that the devotees would worship the deities properly, punctually, cleanly, and the flowers had to be fresh. He liked very much to see the deities nicely decorated. And he would, he, he would watch also to see the devotees doing arti. He didn't like the pujari to stand with his back to the devotees and to just be standing in front of the deities. When somebody would do that, Prabhupada would say, turn them around. And he wanted that when you offer the arti, you must stand to the side, stand to the side. And not that you stand in front of the deities and offer everything, but you stand to the side and you see the deity here on the side and you can see Prabhupada on the right side. So like that Prabhupada would say, turn him around, don't let him just stand in front of the deities. If you go sometimes Hindu temples, they do like that, they just come in front of the deities. But that's not how Prabhupada wanted us to offer our tea. Prabhupada was very particular about a lot of things. You know, like I often tell the story how I was in the Vrindavan temple and it was midday arti. And the midday arti in Vrindavan temple there was not many people, Vrindavan 1976, 
not 75, not many people there. Temple was a bit quiet. So our temple, of course, was out from the, the Lloyd Bazaar. Lloyd Bazaar was where most of the temples are in Vrindavan in those days. So our temple was the first temple to come out of the Lloyd Bazaar. And it was a bit quiet out there. Anyway, it was midday RT and I started to do a little kirtan. I picked up the kartals and began leading the kirtan. The problem is there was nobody there to play the mandanga. There were very few people there. So anyway, I was leading the kirtan, playing the kartals and after five minutes Prabhupada's secretary came out and he said, Prabhupada wants to know, why is nobody playing Madanga? Now Prabhupada was not even in the temple room, he was in his own house at the back, behind the temple. But he was listening to the kirtan. And he was very attentive to all the details, you know, even that you could see that you know, a midday arti. And he could hear the kartals, he couldn't hear any Madanga. And the secretary came out and said, Prabhupada wants to know, why is nobody playing Madanga? There must always be Kartal and Madanga for the Kirtan, at least Kartal and Madanga. So Prabhupada was so concerned about these things. Another time in London, Prabhupada saw, uh, what was it, oh, we got the Parampara pictures wrong on the altar. You know, we were rushing to get the altar ready for the deity greeting and at the last minute put the pictures on the parampara and somehow they got them a bit mixed up and Prabhupada noticed and he chastised the devotees. Why like this? Don't you know these things? Very important. And then another time also we had Jagannath deities up above Radha Landaneshwara. You know, the temple room was very narrow, so they they constructed the altar in the way that Jagannath Baladev Subhadra were up on top and Radha Landanish were, were below. So we put a lot of decoration around Radha Landanishwara, but there were no flowers around Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra. And Prabhupada noticed and he said, Why like this? Why no why so much here and nothing there? He was chastising us, he wanted to make sure we do everything properly. He was very attentive to all the details. And of course he was very concerned about prasadam. Whenever we would do a program, he liked to see the prasadam should be very good. He would taste it himself. He said, I want to see what you're distributing. And he would taste the prasadam, tell us, he would give comments. So he was always very much on top of everything. Although he had put a GBC there, but still Prabhupada was on top of everything and he was noticing, taking care of everything, every detail. And he was very much concerned about the book distribution. He wanted that we would distribute the books. I was telling the other night how in the beginning we were giving the books free. But then Prabhupada said, who's going to pay for the books? We have to pay the printers. He said, if you can't just give the books out freely, people should contribute. He said, every gentleman, if they want to read our Back to Godhead, they must give at least 25 cents. <laughs> so that was like the printing price, you know. So Prabhupada said like that, we had to we, had to, we shouldn't just give the books out freely because then after some time there'll be no, no books. So then Prabhupada was writing books and he, the, the Krishna book was printed. George Harrison had paid for the first printing. So we had boxes of books laying there. We had a few boxes of the Krishna book laying there in our London temple and uh, nobody really knew how to distribute them. Big books, you know, big books. Could, difficult to distribute a magazine. How to distribute a big book? 
we could not imagine how to do it. So the books just sat there, very rarely we could sell a book. Only maybe some person may come to the temple, maybe somebody who is interested and we may introduce the book to them and if we're lucky they can get, the, they would buy a book. And sometimes it was like that, to, to get fruit for offering to the deities in London, you know, fruit is not very cheap. It's quite expensive and fruit is all imported, there's hardly any fruit grows in England, so they import everything and so it's not cheap. And we want to make an offering because every afternoon for the deities Radha Vandaneshwara would make a very nice fruit offering. Prabhupada had set the standard what should be offered at different times in the day. So the deities would take rest in the afternoon and then when we wake them up we would offer them fruit. And, and sometimes there is no money to get fruit. So how to get fruit? We'd, we'd have to find someone to buy a book. <laughs> it was our means of income, to get income for the temple to serve the deities. We have to find someone how to, to and can you can you get one of our books? We'd show the book to them and I try to get the money from them and then use the money then we could go and buy fruit for the deities. So like that we were living in the temple, it was really from day to day we were going on like this. I I remember joining and I was thinking, how long can this last? You know? The way we were living it was so it, it was just so much fly by night, you know, uh, just day by day, one day after another, there was no fun. And of course Prabhupada had done like that, he'd gone to America with no money and somehow he stayed there, he was always thinking maybe I should go back but somehow he stayed on. So it was difficult in the beginning. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj told me one time, he said that he asked Srila Prabhupada, he said to Srila Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, would you have done it any other way than the way you did it? So Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he had the opportunity to be a lot of, to spend a lot of time with Srila Prabhupada. And he, he could ask him these kind of questions. So he asked him one time, he said, he said, Prabhupada, would you have done it any other way than the way you did it? Because the way Prabhupada did it, you know, going to America and getting all the young people, young Westerners and no money, would you have done it any other way? You know, sending all the young people out on the streets, doing Harinam, Sankirtan, and distributing books everywhere so that everybody, everyone knew, you know, this is a Hare Krishna. You know, we were the only ones out there distributing literature practically. We, we started all of this, very few, no other people were doing it, we were doing it. And he, he asked Prabhupada, would you have prepared to have done it some other way? But Prabhupada said, no, he said, I would do it exactly the same way. I wouldn't have changed, I wouldn't do it any other way. Because how did he do it? Sank, he had the devotees go out on Sankirtan. So they were propagating the holy name, they were chanting and they were seen in all the public places. And even today people are devotees, there are countries in the world where the devotees go regularly on Sankirtan and, and people have described how one of the landmarks in London is the Sankirtan party to see the devotees there, the Hare Krishnas chanting. So Prabhupada wanted like that, this is Lord Chaitanya's movement. Lord Chaitanya spent 18 years living in Jagannath Puri and every day he would have Sankirtan. He would go out in the, in the not in, just stay in the temple of Puri, go out of the temple and have Sankirtan, get people to chant the holy name. 
So this is the, 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 the Yuga Dharma, for we have to understand the process for the Kali Yuga, Sankirtan and Prabhupada wanted that and then of course Prabhupada also said there's a higher understanding of Sankirtan that it's not only just playing instruments and singing and dancing in the street but it's also the Brihad Madanga. And Prabhupada spoke about the Brihad Madanga. His Guru Maharaj had given the term Brihad Madanga to the printing press. He said the Madanga can be heard for a few blocks, but the printing press, the, the printing press can go all over the world. And Prabhupada therefore was stressing to the devotees the importance of book distribution. And when a devotee started a newsletter publishing the results of the Sankirtan and the different temples and how many books they had distributed, Prabhupada said, very good, yes, you must do it, and you want this. And so every, every week or every month, I can't remember now, they would publish the Sankirtan newsletter and they would have the different temples and they would put the scores, how many books they had distributed, how many big books, how many medium books, how many small books, and they would put the names of the biggest distributors also. And of course this is going on even today, they have this, you know, especially in India, they have a lot of Sankirtan there, in India it's much easier. Uh, so Prabhupada very, he encouraged this kind of thing, Sankirtan and competition and especially in the USA there was intense competition to distribute books. The devotees would be really energetic and go to great endeavors to distribute books. And there was a big competition one time between the Radha Damodar Sankirtan party and the Los Angeles Temple. Now Los Angeles Temple, because Los Angeles, you know, the climate is a bit nicer there, it's New Dwarka, you know, New York is, you know, the, the big apple, you know, not, not a very nice apple, New York is not a very pleasant place. But Los Angeles, you know, it's kind of nicer there and a lot of people would go to California, they didn't like to just stay in, on the East Coast, they go to the West Coast and be in California and enjoy the sunshine and the nice climate and the opulence and Sankirtan was much easier there. So there were more devotees, there was a big congregation of devotees in Los Angeles and they were generally the top temple in USA and so they were competing with the Radha Damodar party. Tamal Krishna Maharaj had been in India but he didn't like so much preaching in India and he got attracted to come back to the West to be in the USA and he came and joined his friend Vishnu Jana Swami and the two of them had the Radha Damodar party. Now Vishnu Jana Swami, he had the, Radha, he had the party initially on his own. He was just a sannyasi and he had one bus and he traveled around America doing Sankirtan. He was a famous, very famous, very wonderful kirtanir. He, was, he had been a musician before he became a devotee. So he was a very good kirtanir and he attracted a lot of young people. And uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj had been a friend with him so they, they traveled together and Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he, he is a bit more visionary than Vishnu Jana Swami. Vishnu Jana Swami was quite, you know, mellow, easygoing person. He didn't have any big plans or big ambition. But Tamal Krishna Maharaj wanted to do something very big. And he started expanding the Radha Damodar party. They had one bus, and then they got another bus, and then they got vans, and they would and they recruit more and more people and they would go to the universities, go to the campuses and they would put on a concert. And they had people play 
you know, different instruments, the Esaraj and the sitar and everything. You know, these, and it, it, it was really a big draw. In those days, people were very attracted to these things, a cultural program, Indian mystical presentation. And you know, they'd do really nice kirtan and they'd cook an incredible prasadam, you know, blueberry halava and uh, all kinds, malpura and all very, you know, nice tasty like dishes, exotic things which Westerners had never seen before. And when they would taste it, you know, their, their mouth would melt, you know, it would just, wow, this, what is this, you know. They just loved the prasada, they loved the music. And then they've got people like Tamal Krishna Goswami talking to them and saying, so, are you going to come with us? <laughs> are you going to quit school? Leave school and come and join us, you know. It was the 1970s and, you know, people were talking about drop out, you know. <laughs> and then the modern society doesn't have anything to offer you, better to quit, just leave it all behind. And of course America was involved with Vietnam War at the time, they were drafting many young people to join the military, to go to Vietnam and you know, nobody wanted to do it. Everyone was against it. Why? What was this? Why are we fighting in Vietnam? Why? You know, it was, it was a big chaos in the country. People were very up, upset about the whole thing. And they were looking for alternatives. People wanted an alternative lifestyle. And there's Radha Damodar comes along. And Radha Damodar is offering a positive alternative, a different lifestyle. And there you've got these young American people and they're very different and they're outgoing and they've got a philosophy and they're speaking. They're not just speaking a philosophy, they're living their philosophy. So people were attracted and people joined and the Radha Damodar expanded. More and more people were joining and young men, oh, they liked the program, travel around and have festivals, chant and at the same time also preach and distribute books. So there was big competition, Los Angeles temple, they're trying to distribute books and the Radha Damodar, they're distributing books and in this way big competition. At one point Prabhupada said, if you can defeat Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he will have a heart attack. Yeah. Prabhupada was joking, you know, he, he knew how attached Tamal Krishna was. He was very attached to winning, you know, he wanted to always be number one. And, and Prabhupada <laughs> thought, if, if you can beat him, he will have a heart attack. And it, it, it was very, very big uh, competitive thing. Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. But Srila Prabhupada was enjoying all of this. It was, it was all pleasure for Prabhupada. He liked to see the enthusiasm and the great efforts which the devotees would make. And then they introduced, of course, the Christmas marathon. <laughs> Because Christmas is the holiday in the Western countries, particularly in USA. You know, Christmas, the Christmas season, people work all year and they save up. And when it comes to the December, when it comes to December, they'll take their money and they'll go and spend and they'll buy presents and different things, you know. it's a a big season, everybody's in the, the, the Christmas mood, you know, they, all, they have money and they're going there shopping and, and this is when the devotees would go out and distribute most of the books. All year it would be a struggle but in December, you know, you could distribute much, many more books, much easier and big books also. So we had they, they had the, the Christmas marathon 
and the devotees all around the world, they would take part in that Christmas marathon, going out. They, they go out early in the morning, come back very late at night. They'd be out the whole day. And although it's very cold in the winter, they, they would tolerate all the difficulties. And they would do it for Prabhupada's pleasure. And they would feel an ecstasy if they could distribute a lot of books. So we would do like that. I remember I was in New York and we were doing it and we were all going out. Everybody in the temple, there was more than a hundred devotees staying in the temple. And we would all go out, we'd be, you know, it would be organized, we'd all sent out to different parts in New York, all over New York City, distributing books. And we would go out and, you know, if you did a hundred books, they'd say, okay, next week you have to do two hundred. <laughs> and this way we, we had a quota and they would always increase your quota. You know, you, you, they wouldn't say, oh, you did a hundred, very good. They say, next week you have to do two hundred. <laughs> and this way the devotees were working very hard trying to distribute books and please Srila Prabhupada. And everybody was living in the temple. We were all living together, working for the same pleasure of Krishna. So Prabhupada began the movement. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's how it was in, in Prabhupada's time. I, but Prabhupada understood in the future, you know, things will not always be like that. You know, Prabhupada had a lot of experience of the world and he knew things will change in time. And in the beginning we were all living in the ashram and now, of course, the ashrams are not very full, very less people and it's much more congregation based. So you have of course some variation in the preaching now. You have things like, they call it weekend warriors in some parts of the world. They have the program on the weekend, go out and distribute books. Particularly in Canada and USA, they have the, the weekend warriors because people working all week, but get them to do some book distribution on the weekend. Let them get a taste of Sankirtan. Prabhupada wanted everybody in the Krishna Consciousness Movement should know how to distribute his books because it's our family business. So just like if your, fa if your father has a business, so your father will want the son to also learn how to do the business that which he does. That in the future the father gets old or retires, the son will take over the business. So we have our family business. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada used to write books and print books and he was very happy when he saw more books published. And our Srila Prabhupada also took up that business, that work, writing books, publishing books. Initially he began with a back to Godhead, just one sheet of paper, but then he started printing pamphlets and then it became books and it became a set of books, a whole Bhagavatam, 18, vol 18 volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada wrote so many books, Chaitanya Charitamrita, I don't know how many volumes it is now, it was, used to be uh, three, it used to be like fourteen, something, how many volumes in Chaitanya Charitamrita? Nine, nine, nine. nine volumes, nine volumes in Chaitanya Charitamrita. And we have also Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, that's three volumes. So, like so many books are there in our Krishna consciousness movement. So Prabhupada liked that to see many books and the books he liked to see also nicely illustrated. Prabhupada personally instructed the artists what, what to paint and how to paint it. The artists would come with, to, with questions to Prabhupada, they would ask Prabhupada for the details. Prabhupada would give them the answers. Everything had, was done 
under Prabhupada's direction. One time the artist drew a picture of Krishna with big muscles. Prabhupada said, no, no, no. Krishna doesn't need muscles to pick up the whole of them. Well, things like that, you know, it's not always so clear to people how to do things. Who should be young, who should be old, who should be bald, who should have hair, who should have a beard and like this, different, how they should be dressed. All of these things Prabhupada would guide, Prabhupada would instruct. So Prabhupada's books were very important to him and very important to us. It's our legacy, the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Just like in China they call Chuanjapao, right? You know Chuanjapao? Need a Fuchinkini Chuanjapao ma? And the father has, you know, heirlooms, the family treasure. And so when the father, in the will, he'll make a will, this, the treasure should go to this child, and like how it should be divided. So Prabhupada's treasure, Prabhupada's heirlooms, his books, and of course his temples also. The temples are also Prabhupada's, the deities, but especially the books very important, the knowledge which is there in the books. And Prabhupada dedicated so much time writing the books, waking up in the middle of the night and writing the books. That was Prabhupada's ecstasy to be dictating Srimad Bhagavatam. So we are so fortunate we could relish all, the, all of these things. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, nobody had really presented Srimad Bhagavatam anything like what Srila Prabhupada did. And it's accepted by scholars and people all around the world. So Prabhupada wanted us to distribute these books, so he organized, uh, he, he, he said, we should go to the different universities and colleges and introduce the books. So the devotees did that in the USA. They went to the universities and met the scholars and got orders and so on. But then we decided we could do it in other countries as well. So I was in India at the time and we organized, they organized the BBT traveling party to distribute Prabhupada's Bhagavatams and Chaitanya Charitamrita Bhagavad Gita, distributed Prabhupada's books in the universities in India. And we traveled around India. This was in the 1970s. We traveled around India with books. The books all came from America in those days. Nothing was printed in India. We were able to import a few books. So we, we had books but we didn't have a full set of books. We just had we had a few volumes, whatever we could get. You know, Prabhupada was still writing. 1970s, you know, Pra Prabhupada was writing uh, Ninth Canto, 1976. He was on the Ninth Canto, had not been published yet. Seventh Canto had just come out. And then the books had to be shipped from America to come to India. And so there was only limited volumes of books. But we would take whatever books we could get and we traveled around India. And we went everywhere. We went to every place and, and we went to all the different government offices as well and introduced Prabhupada's books. Now often when we would go to the government office, they would say, oh I need permission before I can order. No, I have to get permission and they would ask, who do you have to get permission from? They say, oh the chief, if the chief minister recommends then I can get. So chief minister, you know, chief minister of each state in India, they're big people, you know, they're very important people. And so we would go and try to see the chief minister, you know, it's always very busy, very busy. We would speak to his secretary 
and the secretary would usually be a very nice, pious man, and we'd tell him, you know, we just want to get the chief minister to sign this paper for us. And the, and the, and the, the, the chief minister's secretary would say, what, what paper? What paper is that? Is that? Oh, we just want this. If, if you could just sign this paper for us and it will help us to introduce our books. And we would give the, the secretary, we give him a free magazine and tell him, if you can help us do this, it will be very good for you. Lord Krishna will bless you. So the, the secretary would say, okay, no problem. Put your paper here. He has to sign many papers, right? He's the chief minister. Every day he has to sign so many papers. Every day he's signing papers. Just put your paper in there with all the other papers. He won't even read it. You just sign it. You just sign it. So like that, we got the, we got the recommendations for Prabhupada's books from the different chief ministers. You know, we would write the recommendation, they would put it onto the chief minister's letterhead and he would sign it. And then we would take it to the different institutions. The chief minister recommends these books. And we told Prabhupada when we were doing it, Prabhupada said, very good. <laughs> Prabhupada said, Krishna gave you good intelligence how to do it. So Prabhupada appreciated, he liked to hear all these things. Because Prabhupada himself had distributed books. Before he went to America, he took orders from the different government places. And we, we were taking also orders. We would call it a standing order. And we tell them, when the next book comes, you will get a copy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know. Because the books had not all been printed yet. And they were printing like seven canto, three volumes. Six canto, three volumes, fifth canto, two volumes, fourth canto, four volumes, third canto, four volumes. You know, it was a lot of books, you know. And we didn't have all the books. Whatever books we had, we'd sell them to the temple, we'd sell them to the schools and universities and put the books in there. And, and we'd say, but when we print more, we'll send you more. And so like that, gradually, of course, Things changed and we were able to print books. Now they print, of course, in India and they have all the, they have all the books there. So, and then the four, four volumes became two volumes and the fifth canto became one volume, sixth canto one volume, seventh canto one volume. Bigger books, you know, became a bit easier. But in, in the beginning, we were just doing one volume, one volume, a few volumes, and whatever books we had. And we just somehow we would get these libraries and colleges and things to take the books. So it, it, it meant a lot to Prabhupada. Prabhupada loved to hear about how uh, his books were being distributed. And when he would hear the figures, he would feel very happy. I remember him saying though, I remember one time in New York, uh, there was this one devotee, his name was Triparari, and he, he became a sannyasi, he's a sannyasi today, he's not in ISKCON now, because he, uh, but he's, he's still an active preacher of Krishna consciousness, he's, he went to, he went to one of Prabhupada's god brothers and then he went on his own. He has his own society now. But his name was Triparari and Prabhupada called him an incarnation of book distribution. <laughs> an incarnation of book distribution. And so he used to distribute a lot of books. He was very expert in talking, getting people to take books. But Prabhupada, I remember he was there in New York one time when Prabhupada came and Prabhupada was saying, don't force people to get the books. They must want to take the book. You should not force them to take the book. And Prabhupada didn't like that people would complain. If you know, some people would complain, they forced me to get the book, you know, they forced me. So Prabhupada told this devotee, he told all of us and particularly that devotee, that don't force people, don't push people, let them buy the books if they want. Mm -hmm.
one time in, in India, the, the devotees were doing a program in the palace of one Maharaja. And they had a program, and Prabhupada told the one devotee, I think it was Hansadura Prabhu, he told Hansadura Prabhu, he said, ask the Maharaja to purchase a set of our books. So Pra the Prabhu spoke, he gave a talk and he asked the Maharaja, so we have all these books, would you like to purchase a set of the books? And the Maharaja said, no, no, it's okay, I have so many books, you know, I don't need your books, I have so many books. So the devotee asked Prabhupada afterwards, he said, did I say something wrong, Prabhupada, he didn't buy the books. And Prabhupada said, no, he said, everything you said was all right. He said, it's okay. He said, people want to buy the books, let them buy the book. We cannot expect everyone will purchase all the time. But he said, you spoke well and that's the main thing. So Prabhupada understood. He said that he said maybe maybe you should have spoken Srila Prabhupada and then he would have purchased the books. But Prabhupada said he said, Well if I had spoken and he didn't purchase the book, then it would not be very good for him. So I that's why I didn't speak. <laughs> so Prabhupada understood sometimes. He, he, want, he didn't want anything unfortunate to happen to people. He liked to bless people. Okay, any question? Anybody? Anything? Anything? Yes, Prabhu? Chan, Chan. I was just wondering um, when you are distributing books in, in the USA, especially the big books, what usually would you say to get people to buy them? I mean, these are festivals, they have not come across these kind of things, and especially big books. How would you get them to buy these things? Well, we would show them the book and we show the pictures in the book, especially the illustrations in the book. They're very attractive and maybe talk a little bit about the illustration. <coughs> if I was selling a Krishna book, I would show the introduction and say, look, George Harrison's written here, the introduction, you know, in those days, of course, everybody knew George Harrison and I'd show them that and hmm, that, that would usually be enough, you know. And usually a sale is a, a quick thing. It's not really a long, it doesn't usually take a long time to, if somebody's going to get the book and you know, they're, they're interested, you know, go get it. You don't have to spend a lot of time with them. But if they have the interest, they like the book, it's attractive, then, and they have the money, then they could, they'll get it. Not a big problem. Especially countries like USA, you know, people have money there, they carry more money and they buy books, they buy things. <coughs> so you, you don't have to spend a lot of time with people. The main thing is that, you know, they're a little interesting. So you see that spark of interest and so you get them to get a, give a book, take a book. Sometimes it would happen, you know, you're distributing there and somebody gives you the donation. Then they may give you, you know, a bit more than what you expected. And so then, you know, you give, you're just giving them a small book and they give you a bit more than what you expected to get. So then you give them a bigger book. And when you give them a bigger book, they'll come back and give you even a bigger donation. <laughs> it goes like that, you know. And when they give the bigger donation, then you give the big book. <laughs> So sometimes like that, people sometimes they, they want to check you out, they want to see how, how, how greedy are you, how much are you just trying to get money, are you just trying to get money or are you actually genuine, are you really a genuine uh, practitioner of a spiritual path, some people check you out like that, of course. In the beginning of our movement, there were a lot of doubt, 
a lot of doubts about our people and how sincere they are and who are they. So these things have to be overcome. I was listening to one interview, Gopal Krishna Goswami was on a television program in Vancouver and this one man was asking him, he said, you people, you know, you're always on the street pushing people to give donations just to buy your books. And Gopal Krishna Maharaj told me, he said, well, that was in the beginning of our movement. He said, that was in the very early beginning of our movement. But now we have our congregation, we have our… He said, now we give the books out freely. He said, you, you don't see us pushing people to give donations nowadays. Rather often we're giving out the books freely to people. Chantipur. Maharaj, uh, Maharaj, you're explaining about Prabhupada instruction about Puja to stand on the side when doing the Arati. Uh, is there any instruction to do for the Abhishek or Maharaj? Because so sometimes they see Puja is they stand in front and block. So, uh, is there any instruction for it in Abhishek time? No, I don't know directly about that. We didn't do a lot of Abhishek. <laughs> it wasn't going on very often in Prabhupada's time. It's something which has been more introduced in recent times. So it wasn't so common. But it, it makes sense, you know, to be, you know, not to obstruct when you're doing these things, to stand to the side and let people see the deity and see the deity being big. Usually when we do the Abhishek in Mayapur, it's like that. There's nobody in the front of the deity. Everyone is either at the back or at the side of the deity. Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Go back to Vrinda ki. World Holy Name Week ki. Some mm -hmm. Maha Prasadam here for everybody. Thank <laughs> you. 